Uh, friends, uh, we are uh, we are starting now. Today is 175th Friday group meeting. Very very important milestone in our Friday group history. There is no doubt at all because of all of you, people like sir, like our uh, speakers, like Tarpagam Vinayagam, and other people, they made this journey too. So the as on date, our viewers in the Friday group, our channel. 11 lakhs 13,630. <laughs> we have 25,000 subscribers. Uh, as on date, 126 videos are available. That is uh, uh, our little bit background. Uh, the topic is law and uh, literature. The speaker is our beloved senior advocate, Mr. Dhamma Sheshadri Naidu. Uh, last time we have given enough uh, uh, about Sir. He, taken voluntary retire from Bombay High Court, then after that seriously is practicing here. So sir is chosen here. Uh, so sir, now you can start your initiate your uh, this thing. We are all uh, last time sir address on 2nd December 2022, art of legal drafting. That is our 164th Friday group meeting. After that now it's a 175th. Sir immediately accepted. We are all grateful to you sir. Uh, definitely we will enjoy. Thank you very much, sir, for this second opportunity within no time. Literally a couple of months, I got the second calling. And you know pretty well, if you are known to many people, you are called popular. If you are known to many people, that's in a positive way. On the converse, if you are known to many people in a negative way, it's called notoriety. <laughs> I believe Friday group has made me popular. <laughs> I'll tell an instance how popular it has become. Last before week, I was in airport in the security gate. You know, you just have to go through a serpentine queue. Somebody who is ahead of you may be parallel to you in the queue. A young lawyer, still in his white clothes, was also going from Delhi to somewhere else. I was going to some other high court. And uh, he looked at me and said, Are you Mr. Naidu, sir? Oh, no, no, he said, Are you Jesse Naidu, sir? I said, Yes. Sir, I heard your lecture on Friday group. <laughs> <laughs> he told me, Sir, I'm from Calcutta. I came over here to brief a senior counsel. I briefed and I'm going back. Sir, please note down my number. I may call you occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> That's how popular Friday group has made me. Indeed, it's an honor for me to be amongst you for this 175th meeting, you can call, or a session, a profound one, with such popularity and such consistency of quality. And of course, many architects are there, the chief architect being Sri Seshigiri Rao. And, uh, you know, initially I thought that, and in fact, Seshigiri Raoji insisted no, this time you talk something subject proper. <laughs> because he knew my pension for some speaking something nonsense. So he told me, you should speak something proper. Then he gave me a broad choice, go for a constitution. Because I always believed, rather I have had profound faith in the wisdom of all my colleagues advocates. And I always believe, what is somewhere written, I need not speak about. You are capable of reading that. And with all your exposure and experience, I don't think anybody can add anything to that one. Of course, there are scholars who can still do something about it. But anyway, then, sheepishly I suggested, can I talk on non-literature? Because even when I was teaching in judicial academies, 
I have always chosen things which are not there in books because nobody is going to find fault with me. <laughs> I get away. Right? So, I have told Sashikar Ravji that can I have that one? I said, give me 10 minutes. I have to cross check with all my friends, and then I'll get back. Then he got back to me and said, go ahead. Then the real dilemma began for me. <laughs> what should I speak about law and literature? Is it how law influenced literature or how literature influenced law? Or the interaction between <coughs> law and literature, how they enriched each other? Then I have chosen entirely a different path. That is, the other day in my office, as all young boys and girls do, all my colleagues when I was absent were sitting and chatting away with I came back. With a bit of deference, they would uh, sit straight and they would be doing something or pretending doing something. <laughs> I told them, be a selfish lawyer. Be a selfish lawyer. What is meant by this being a, be a selfish lawyer? I have told them, if you are gossiping or chatting away, obviously it must be about somebody else. Then, please, every day, whatever you do, put a question to you, yourself. Is it useful for me? So young lawyers ought to be very tenaciously selfish. Think of every minute about yourself. How you are going to improve yourself. You know, when I was tempted to watch, not glorifying myself, only for the sake of advocates, young advocates rather, when I was tempted in my formative years of advocacy because I entered late, practice in a Mufasil court, I would have some temptation to watch a movie or to watch TV for a while. Then I would sit, yield to the temptation 5-10 minutes, then I would question myself. Why should I watch when somebody performs? I should perform. Let others watch. That's what I would like to tell to young lawyers. Don't ever fritter away your time. Never ever admire anybody. Admire yourself. You are second to none. So, I have chosen this topic so that instead of a sort of a meta discourse, that means Discourse about discourse. I don't want to indulge in that. Instead, I'd like to speak how exposure to literature can enrich your advocacy skills. On the last occasion, I always believe when it comes to advocacy, it has got three elements. It's perhaps oversimplification, but let me tell you. It has got three elements. One is read stories, write stories, tell stories. This is advocacy. Last time we discussed how to write stories. That is drafting part. Today we are going to talk about read stories. How to prepare yourself to be a good advocate. What are the external sources you can have? Where can you have the edge over others? Otherwise, you all tend to read the same law books. How can somebody score over us? How can somebody be more brilliant than us? How can somebody better articulate than us? So what could be that external element? That we'll discuss. And Friday group doesn't get bored with me. Next time, I'll talk about how to tell stories. That is the oral arguments. <laughs> you know, I, when I started, popularity, and I used another word here, N-O-T-O-R-I-E-T-Y. How do you pronounce that? I said, notoriety. Please remember, have you ever realized the power of sound? You know, every language has its own beauty. If I, as a coming from southern part, 
speak Hindi, I don't, I can't rather, you would be laughed at me because of my accent. And if you try to speak my mother tongue, Telugu, I would be laughing at you. But please remember, have you ever seen Vedic chanting? Vedic chanting. You know the rhythm, the cadence and the mesmerism in it. Sama Veda is said to be the Veda of music. And there is one person in Hyderabad, a very famous, uh, what do you call, uh, Mridang, that instrument, tabla you can call it. He can play Sama Veda on that one and send you into, into trance. Because of the rhythm, the sound. And of course the lore, the myth says, when Charaka and Susurusha, they were performing operations, they say, they used Samaveda as an what do you call anesthesia. As anesthesia. <coughs> Why I say we all admire Krishnaya not only for the content, for the way he expresses himself. You could see most of that in alliteration form. That's why I say words soothe like music. Or disturb us like a quarrel. Or elevate us like oratory. You take the example of great orators, orators. Every great leader, even for that matter, great dictators, they have harnessed the power of sound. They have swayed people. They have subjugated people not with weapons, with their words and with their way with the words. How they use them. You take the worst of the human beings you could ever think of. Hitler. You see on YouTube the way he speaks. So what distinguishes before the court? Our power of expression. And that gets enhanced. If you pay attention to every word, how it releases its power when pronounced correctly. That's why they've said, Vakyam Rasamayam Kavyam. A sentence well uttered is what the whole Kavya. We all say, for example, M O R T G A G E. M O R T G A G E. How do you pronounce it? Yeah, most of us do say mortgage, T. It's a French word, it should be mortgage. Why I say it, it may be somewhat a fetish of a thing, but that extra edge you will have when you pay attention to these minute things. Have the power of expression and that takes you places. That's why there's a lot of difference between euphony and cacophony. Right? What's meant by pandemonium? Any idea? Right. Pan means all. Demons means the devils. Milton in his Paradise Lost coined that word that was not in English up to that point in time. He coined that word. If something of a chaotic condition prevails, as if all the devils have been let loose, that's pandemonium. Right. Now, having said that one, let me come back to the topic. I just would like to underline the fact that, young lawyers, please pay attention to what you speak and pay attention to what, how or how you utter. Have you ever heard Stephen Fry speaking? Have you ever heard Stephen Fry speaking? Please listen to that guy. He's an English actor, a writer, and everything. A multifaceted personality. Listen to him, you will see, because you don't need to invent any wheel. It's already been invented. Make use of it for the best purpose. So there are people who have paid the waves, ways rather, on any walk of life. You can as well imitate them. Life is a big imitation after all. Learning is, for that matter, the same thing. And have you heard about Alain de Botton? No? He's again a philosopher born in Switzerland, 
but naturalized uh, Englishman now, a professor in Oxford, popular philosophy. He also speaks very well. Please listen to him. You will just get the clues how to articulate yourself. And whenever I just put a question, don't ever think that I know and I'm trying to betray your ignorance, rather expose your ignorance. No. Young liars alone need to answer if at all I ask anything. And don't feel shy because I, uh, last time also I remember that I said we hold ourselves back for the simple reason we think in binary terms, right and wrong. No, please give up. In law there is nothing right, there is nothing wrong. There are many shades to it. So think freely. Now tell me, what is the doctrine of lateral support? Can anybody? Anybody can tell me. Yes, madam. If I answer, it would be cheap. No, please. You are an insider. You are prohibited from giving information. Since she hails from my office. <laughs> yes, please. And where will you find... All right. You can as well have access to your smartphones. I know that. Where will you find a good answer for that one? Perhaps in Black's Law Dictionary? Or Ramnath Ayers? I'll just read one sentence from a book. Guess which is that book? The doctrine of lateral support. That is the right of all property to have the natural, normal support of the adjoining property. This is the meaning of the doctrine of natural, uh, rather lateral support. It's a common law doctrine. Could you tell me? Where have I taken this definition? Could you guess? It's from a novel. The novel is Earl Stanley Gardner. Have you heard about him? Earl Stanley Gardner, the Perry Mason series. Now we have forgotten the author, like Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes. Earl Stanley Gardner is the counterpart of the American counterpart for Sherlock Holmes. Perry Mason, in one novel called The Case of the Nervous Accomplice. In that one, the fact is this. See, a poor lady has a piece of property, real property or removable property as you call, and she has a house on it. A rich man purchases a larger extent of the neighboring land. He wants to have a dream project built over there, say a hotel, and then he asks this lady, please sell away your property, including the house. I would like to demolish, and then I would like to have my project. That lady refuses. She says, no, it's all a matter of my memories, my ancestral, my house, I, I can't afford to. He offers a lot of money, everything, she's stubborn. Then what he does, technically, this is the boundary. To the right is that man's land, to the left is this lady's land our house standing on the edge. So he started laying foundation for his multi-story building, started digging so deep, so close to the boundary, that exposed that lady's house foundation. It was on the edge of collapse. Then he would answer, I have been digging in my own land. How could you question that one? I have not trespassed upon your land. She goes to Perry Mason. And the Perry Mason says, all right, I'm going to win the case. He goes to the court, he pleads the doctrine of lateral support. It's a facet of easement, right? Honestly, until I read this one, I didn't know about the doctrine. Where did I find it? And there is another recorded instance. That is, in a UK hospital, a patient was admitted and the patient was poisoned, obviously, or apparently. The doctors were clueless about the symptoms. Only when you know the type of poison, you can administer the antidote. Right? Here, the doctors were clueless. What should they do? And the nurse told them, it must be so-and-so poison. 
nurse who didn't have any exposure to toxicology still has a guess perhaps and told him told the doctors that it must be so and so doctors had no other option because they didn't know what else it could be so they had to administer the antidote they administered it worked a miracle and the doctors was stupefied and they asked the nurse how did you know this is that's a very textbook case very rare poison they have read only long back in colleges about the symptoms they never seen a live example then how did she this nurse know she told them i have read a gathe christi novel there somebody has been poisoned and the symptoms have been described there <laughs> right that that's the that there's the power of literature when it comes to your advocacy and having said that one what will i gain if i read shakespeare milton bernard shaw even for that matter charles dickens all these people so let me come to the movies i don't say that to watch movies i only say one instance how things unrelated what you call improve your performance have you ever seen you must have seen i know that one karate kid what is that boy's name jenny smith will smith son and jacky chan so the single mother along with her son has been transferred to beijing there this boy was bullied endlessly so brutalized he runs away then uh, he finds shelter in this drunkard uh, that uh, maintenance man jacky chan right so when he was coming back from school every day he would take off his vest and he would throw it on the floor his mother always insists put it on the sill whatever sill that's been there to hang it on to the sill this man this boy begrudges being rebellious in his teens says that no i don't do it mother scolds him all these things happen he goes to his master then since he saw that incident in this house when he came out to fix some plumbing problem jacky chan makes him do the same thing for the next two months this boy gets frustrated i thought this man would teach me some martial arts as you must be thinking i have been speaking something sensible and talk about everything nonsense <laughs> right the same way the boy also felt that way there and he felt that i thought this man would teach me some martial arts so that i could go and beat those bullies but he's been asking me to put that to the sill and take it off put it to the sill and take it off what am i going to gain so he does it dutifully because of the master scolding two months down the line he starts teaching him but surprisingly his movements have been vastly improved because of his doing that one this is called collateral advantage don't ever think that by reading cbc you are going to be a master certainly you have to read that one but to take it across to the bench to impress you need the medium of expression and what better source than well articulated expressions like literature because they measure they weigh the structure every sentence so what better way can you have to do that one let me tell you once a young boy of 12 years wrote to a very famous supreme court judge in the us you can guess the name otherwise i'll be telling you sir i wanted to practice study law i wanted to join law college so tell me what i should read it's only five lines or six lines should i read that legendary judge's response to that young boy it applies to all of us my dear paul no one can be a truly competent lawyer unless he is a cultivated man if i were you i'd forget about any technical preparation for the law the best way to prepare for the law is to be a well read person does alone can one acquire the capacity to use the english language on paper and in speech and 
with the habits of clear thinking which only a truly liberal education can give. No less important for a lawyer is the cultivation of the imaginative faculties by reading poetry, seeing great paintings in the original or in easily available reproductions and listening to great music. Stock your mind with the deposit of much good reading and widen and deepen your feelings by experiencing, by experiencing vicariously as much as possible the wonderful mysteries of the universe and forget about your future career. With good wishes, sincerely yours, then who? Felix Frankfurter. You just read his judgments. They truly reflect his depth of learning through literature. I don't think anybody has become a great judge, for that matter, a great lawyer, without exposure to literature. Anecdotal, yesterday, when I began thinking of this topic, I wanted to find that extract, any of, any of you can guide me. Once I read a book on Hachim Sirwai. In that book, an incident was narrated about the invitation by the then Chief Justice of India to that great advocate to don the bench of the Supreme Court. Had he accepted that invitation, he would have been our Chief Justice of India for eight long years. Which book? I, I just couldn't recollect. Any of you can tell me. Fast trips. There are a couple of fast trips released in his honor. First one by fast trip. Fast means festival. Ship means writing in German. If any book is launched or released in honor of a particular person or a popular personality, it's called fast shift. Right. So there, Silvoy, in his early 50s, I believe, came home, told his wife that he got an invitation from the Honorable the Chief Justice of India to down the bench in the Supreme Court. What should he do? Before the wife could answer, kindly remember, based on my memory I'm telling, since it gets recorded, maybe right, wrong, but anecdotal, I read it. Then, before his wife could answer, his children, young school-going children, rushed in, heard the conversation. They said, dear Papa, we don't want to leave Bombay. Then I was told, he wrote back to the Chief Justice of India. Dear Chief Justice, I felt honored you have invited me, but I regret my inability because I have three priorities in my life. One, family. Two, literature. Three, law. Strictly in that order. That's the saying of perhaps one of the greatest advocates we have ever seen. He has put law next to literature. Let me tell another example. Another Doyle, perhaps, arguably the greatest. Nani Palkiwan. He always prized his skills as a literata rather than as a lawyer. He put them above. He never spent a day without reading something. What's reading? on the literary side. And that marked him to be an entirely different advocate. And very recently, you must have seen Sony Sarabji, a die-hard fan. When he was there, somebody asked him, how do you while away your time? He said, by reading poetry. Abraham Lincoln, as the president of the USA never read newspapers. He always read poetry. Somebody asked him, Mr. President, you're a politician. You should be spending a lot of time with politics. You should know what's going on around. You should be reading the newspaper. Then he said, 
the oldest thing and the most useless thing on earth is yesterday's newspaper. <laughs> when something becomes worthless within a couple of hours, why should I read that one? Poetry is eternal. That's another great man. You must have seen his Gettysburg address, just stretching into a couple of pages. How memorable it's been. Could it be possible without his being a fan of literature? I don't think that's possible. You take any great advocate, you take any great judge, it's inevitable. And let me tell you, I've been telling my weakness and I trust my strength, for others it's weakness, for me my strength, is storytelling. Let me tell you another story. We have seen our mythological foundations. Now I don't have much exposure. You don't see a better judge than Rama, personification of righteousness, and you don't see a better advocate than Krishna, craftiness personified. In the same way, let me talk about Greek mythology. Have you ever heard about uh, Lord Sumption or Justice Jonathan Sumption, who retired a few years ago as the English Supreme Court? Right. Please watch his wreath lectures. The topic is Law and Decline of Politics. It's available and uh, it's also Transcript is also available. If you Google it, you'll get it. Very profound lecture. It's 49 pages in transcript, about 45 minutes to close to one hour or one and a half hours in lecture form. They both are available. Please listen to it. He covers, very recently that's been delivered, he covers all nuances of modern tendencies in uh, legal parlance in this firmament quite an edifying experience for any young lawyer. He tells about how this mythical lore has viewed the courts. He takes the example of Athenian Trojan War history and he says, you see, in the beginning, that's how he begins his speech as well, you can check. In the beginning, there was chaos and brute force, a world without law. In the mythology of ancient Athens, Agamemnon, have you heard about this character Agamemnon? This Agamemnon had to wage the war because Helen of Troy was taken away by Paris. So they had to invade. So he goes to an oracle, a soothsayer. That oracle says, if you want safe passage of your ship to reach the shores of the enemy, you should sacrifice your only daughter. Superstitious those days. So he sacrifices his only daughter. He goes on. You know that Achilles and everybody, he wins the war and comes back. His wife kills him in retaliation because her daughter was killed. And their son kills the mother in retaliation to avenge his father's death. So he says, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, put an end to the cycle of violence by creating a court to impose a solution in what today we would call the public interest. A solution based on reason, on the experience of human frailty, on the fear of the alternative. It's not historical, mythical, but even there they have said to end violence to ensure that reason prevails, people are safe, safe. That's how courts have come about, is that one. Then, in the end it says, let no man live un uncurbed by law or curbed by tyranny. That's how it's been said. I pass for one minute, and I would like to seek, uh, how much is it? 
Confucianism. It's a storytelling. Yeah. Thank you. So, that's been written in 5th century BC. Then Jonathan Sumption says, Law is not just an instrument of corrective or distributive justice. It is an expression of corrective values and an alternative to violence and capricious despotism. It's a voice of some lawyers that they talk about law as if, as if it was a self-contained subject. Something to be examined like a laboratory specimen in a test tube. But law does not occupy a world of its own. It's part of a larger system of public decision making. That's indeed true. And what has Denning said? Denning said, a lawyer need not be master of anything, but he should be jock of all trades. He advises, read anything, anything that comes your way. Don't ever let go. That's the advice of that great man. Now, let me see how other courts have taken literature in adjudication. Let me, you must know the uh, concept of dying declaration, the legal nuances of dying declaration, which is the one that's been quite often invoked by the courts. What is that one? <coughs> Should I tell that sentence? Truth sits upon the lips of a dying man. Right? You Google it, how many times it's been used by the Supreme Court? Countless number of times. Its proposition, its validity, right or wrong, is a different story. You know who said it? Said this? Matthew Arnold. That poet and playwriter. Matthew Arnold said that one. It's been used many, many times. Right? It's been Supreme Court articulated. It's believed that when a man is at the point of death, and when every expectation of this world is gone, he hushes away every motive of lie. But you'll have your own reservations. It may not be universal true. But the power of expression there, that's why it's been quoted quite often. Now, let me come to another one. How many times Shakespeare has been quoted? For that matter, any number of times. The latest one by the Supreme Court was on 12-1-2023 in Prakashnai versus State of Goa. Then how many times Merchant of Venice I have noted down the number of times as well. The latest is on 7-9-2022 in Shiv Kumar versus the state of Madhya Pradesh. Then let me see Charles Dickens, quoted equally quite often. From which book? <coughs> Bleak House. You know the story of John Dice and John Dice. Is it John Dice and John Dice or is it John Dice versus John Dice? or uh, Roe versus Wade, or Roe and Wade, or Maneka Gandhi versus <coughs> Union of India, or Maneka Gandhi and Union of India. Which is the correct expression? Versus? And my office is prohibited. Others can say. I'll tell you, actually the practice was, and that's why if you read Bleak House, you would always say, John Dice and John Dice. It was not versus. What happened those days in Inns Court, right, in the temple Inns Court, the law clerks were so illiterate. And they were using ampersand. You know ampersand? Quite a curvy one. And ampersand. They could not write ampersand. They put the last part as B. So we started reading as verses. It is not versus, it's an, right, <coughs> one tidbit. So you know that a scarecrow of a craze, recently it's been invoked, as 30th <coughs> April 2019, it's been invoked by the Supreme Court, saying about the delayed ones. Then you have seen Alexander Pope, Robert Frost. What Robert Frost is famous for? Yes, please. Yeah, which is a famous poem we all should read and inspire. Before I sleep, I sleep. The road less traveled, right? You have better praise. The poem is the road less traveled, right? 
in one of my judgments, please, this is self praise, forgive me. In one of my judgments, I quoted him saying, Oats are like leaves, and where they most abound, much fruit, fruit of sense beneath it rarely found. When you, when your pleadings are prolix, <coughs> verbose, the meaning is the casuality. That's what I've said. Then you know George Orwell. How many times we have invoked George Orwell? His 1984, his Animal Farm, right? All those aspects, the Big Brother theory, right? Then comes Bernard Shaw. You know, Bernard Shaw is anybody's favorite after Shakespeare. If I wanted to quote something, I don't know who that is. I'll quote either Shakespeare or Bernard Shaw. <laughs> He's been quoted quite often. And the latest was on 1st April 2022. Then the irrepressible satirist Mark Twain. He's been quoted by our Supreme Court on 13-10-2022 in Nandalal Bharti versus State of Uttar Pradesh. Right? He, see, that man speaks about interpretation. Charles Dick, sorry, um, what is his name? Mark Twain speaks about, it's like this, take a word, split it up into letters. The letters may individually mean nothing, but when they are combined, they will form a word pregnant with meaning. That is the way how we have to consider the circumstantial evidence. You have to take all the circumstances together and judge for yourself whether the prosecution have established their case. Right? Then comes Sherlock Holmes. The latest invocation is on 24, 24th April 2020. And mostly we use him saying that it doesn't require Sherlock Holmes brains to understand this. It's plain, elementary. Dr. Watson, the catchphrase is, it's elementary Dr. Watson, right? He has been quoted. Then, there have been other instances as well, but I request you to read one judgment to see, is it possible for us to express anything about the environmental concept more profoundly than what was by an illiterate Red Indian chief in about how many years? That's uh, 150 years ago. Their judgment is Sri Sachidananda Pandey was in the state of West Bengal. And that's 1987, 2 SEC 295. Right? And uh, should I repeat that one? Yes. 1987, 2 SEC, 295. It's about environmental hazards. Honorable Justice Sochina Pared decodes that passage. And in that case, the US federal government went on expanding the cities. <laughs> And they wanted the Red Indian native settlements to be cleared, acquired, and built upon. So the Red Indians resist. Then he sends an ultimatum. Vacate, we'll pay you. Go away and build somewhere. Don't hold on to that one. And that man replies. I'll read only two sentences or three sentences, but it's just brain expanding substance when it comes to articulation. How can you buy or sell the sky? The warmth of the land, the idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, how can you buy them? Every part of the earth is sacred to my people. Every shine, shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every clearing and humming insect is holy in the memory and experience of my people. The sap which courses through the trees carries the memories of the red man. The white man's dead forget the country of their birth when they go to walk among the stars. Our dead never forget this beautiful earth for it is the mother of the red man. We are part of the earth and it's part of us. The perfumed flowers are our sisters. 
the horse, the great eagle, these are our brothers. The rocky crests, the juices in the meadows, the body heat and the pony, and man, all belong to the same family. So when the great chief in Washington sounds, sends word and he wishes to buy our land, he asks much of us. The great chief sends word he will reserve us a place so that we can live comfortably to ourselves. He'll be our father and we'll be children. So we'll consider your offer to buy our land, but it will not be easy, for this land is sacred to us. This shining water moves in the streams and rivers is not just water, but the blood of our ancestors. If we send you land, you must remember that it's sacred. And you must teach your children that it is sacred and that each ghostly reflection in the clear water of the lakes tells of events and memories in the life of my people. The water's murmur is the voice of my father's father. The rivers are our brothers. They quench our thirst. The rivers carry our canoes and feed our children. If we sell you, you your, our land, you must remember and teach your children that the rivers are our brothers and, yours, and you must henceforth give the kindness you would give any brother. It goes on, it goes on like that one. Quite a big passage. I don't want to bother you with all this one. But it's worth reading and reading. That's what I can tell. Now, let's take natural justice. You have heard so much written about natural justice. But if something is put into perspective with something spectacular that sticks to your mind, you would never forget. In, I think, which is the year that is? 1723. An English court talked about the principles of natural justice. And that's been quoted by our Supreme Court at least 20 times. That is the story of Adam and Eve. What's been said, you please remember. We are, this is from our Supreme Court, 2013, 10 SEC 114. Messrs. A.S. Motors, Private Limited, was issued in a film here. <coughs> Beg your pardon? Yeah. Yes, please. 2013, 10 SEC 114. We are further aware that it's been stated that apart from laws of men, Laws of God also observe the rule of order ultra important. It's been stated that the first hearing in human history was given in the Garden of Eden. God did not pass sentence upon Adam and Eve before giving an opportunity to show cause as to why they had eaten the forbidden fruit. Will you ever forget this concept? Otherwise, any number of times we have heard about that one. But it's illustrated with a mythical concept, Adam and Eve, they ate the forbidden fruit. And then, God didn't straight away punish because God is omniscient. He knows everything. He could have assumed that, yes, you made a mistake, I have to punish you. He said that, please give an explanation. So this post-factum justification of hearing is of no consolence for anybody. It has to be before that one. See how it's been expressed. And remember, it's the distilled wisdom of centuries. You take any classic, you take any book, it certainly enriches. And also, if uh, have you heard about Daniel Amen? Daniel Amen is a, a very famous neurophysicist, and he has scanned hundreds of thousands of brains to study the impact of uh, digital technology on the brain. About 15 years ago, he wrote four or five books. Beautiful Brain at Any Age is one of the books. He said the internet exposure and uh, the prohibited drugs like uh, cocaine or any psychotropic substance they affect the brain the same way. More than 30 minutes of internet exposure, our brain undergoes. This is called dopamine toxicity. And there have been digital de-addiction camps across the world now. 
and he said with constant exposure to this visual, digital visual information, our brain tends to undergo brain atrophy. You know what happened? In London, there are about, subject to correction, more than 37,000 streets. If you want to be qualified as a cab driver, you need to know every street. The Asian boys, especially Indian, Pakistani and Afghan origin, sorry, uh, Bangladeshi origin, they take a bike, they crisscross all the streets two years, then they write the test and they pass, they get the license. That's why most cab riders of okay, cab drivers in London are of South Asian origin. You know, one neuroscientist examined their brains, the cab driver's brains. They had frontal lobe, the front part. The frontal lobe, slightly bigger than, frontal lobe, spatial memory it stores. So it's slightly bigger than the usual, because of their remembering all the spaces. Later, GPS has come. Then started using GPS. Then, down the line, 10 years later, the same doctor examined most of them. Their brain has shrunk. See, when you read, it leaves scope for imagination. When you watch, it kills your imagination. So don't watch. Please read. Mind you, Shakespeare predates Sigmund Freud. You all remember. You can check more than a century or whatever. He predates him. But whatever Sigmund Freud said in behavioral psychology, you find in Hamlet. Right? How beautifully he has analyzed. So what else, what better course can you have if you say a negative word about a woman, she would just retaliate and slap at you, justifiably. And you quote Shakespeare, frailty thy name is woman. Would they say anything? I don't. But of course, it equally applies. I am not taking the gender stand, please forgive me. <laughs> Since the occasion demanded, I said, how to use literature to convey your point. And you have seen, we think on the feet. As lawyers, we think on the feet. And the judges, without being pejorative, without being negative, they think on the butt. Right? And you have to be quick with it. Once an honorable judge asks you something, you need to be quick with it. How does, you have seen greatest uh, anecdotes from lawyers, famous lawyers, how beautifully they express themselves, how they extricate themselves from difficult situations. All these things. Again, and not comparing with anybody, since as I was practicing in a Murfazal court, one day I was arguing a divorce case in a family court. <coughs> Morning, I argued for the husband. Afternoon, I had to argue for the wife. Same case, diametrically opposite. And the learned judge told me, Mr. Naidu, whatever you argued in the morning, I will adopt them. <laughs> for the wife. <laughs> then, I told him, then we address your honor. Your honor, <coughs> if your honor permits me, I'll tell a story. <laughs> he said, tell a story. I told him, once Maoli Nasiruddin went home and his wife offered him some cheese. So, it's delicious. He ate it. He praised it and wanted more. His wife said, sorry dear, it's exhausted. Children took all of it. Whatever had been left, I have given to you. Then he started telling all the negative qualities of cheese. His wife asked him, how come a while ago you were praising, now you criticize that? He says, had it been available, first one was right. <laughs> right? Since it's not available, the second one is right. Another instance, we filed a suit for 
internship in my office. We were not given. Notice was served under the side. They suppressed that. They filed a suit. They got an injection against us. We filed for vacate under Order 39, Rule 4. I'll finish it in two three minutes. We filed vacate under Order 39, Rule 4. Then, you know, cleverly the senior counsel on the other side, when he filed the plaint, he wrote with pen, manuscript, the plaintiffs heard the respondents have also taken some judicial proceedings. So, I was young at the bar, I started arguing, saying that I thought it's a show fire case for me. Suppression of material fact, well, it has to go. And the senior counsel on the other side stood up and said, where is suppression? I have written. Then I have told the judge. My last my permit to tell the story. He said, go. He said, when Mahabharata war was going on, because of his righteous stand, Dharmaja, Dharmaraja, I don't know which way you call him, Yudhista, Yudhista, his chariot was never touched the ground. It was minimum three feet above. It was floating. Dronacharya was decimating. What's going to be decimating? Can you tell me? There's a meaning for that one. You know, again, it's a matter of mythology. When one king wins over the, his enemy, his army has to be reduced to size. He will ask all the enemy soldiers and he kills every tenth man. It's called decimation, killing the tenth man. But by usage now, it means decimation means complete destruction. Opposite meaning. Right. So, Dronacharya started decimating. And these people were clueless how to stop that man. Right. And he had only one son, Ashwatthama. And he was born after a lot of penance and other things. So if somebody could kill him, he would not fight. And even that man was equally valorous and not that easy to kill. And then what happened? There is an elephant called Ashwatthama. So Krishna tells Bhima to kill it. And tells Dharmaja, in this tell, you tell Aswadhamma Ataha. That man refuses. I'm a gold standard for honesty. How could you ask me to tell a lie? I don't tell. Then he says, I said Krishna is a crafty lawyer. Then he tells, okay, you tell Kunjara also, that means elephant. But I'll use my conch and that sound will be drowned. So it's a stratagem. So he did that one. So he just left his what you call uh, bow and arrow, they kill him. Right? But because of that half truth, Asvadama, Atha, Kunjara, he said dutifully, but with a craftiness. He was part of that conspiracy. So his chariot came onto the earth. I told this story to the judge and said, what they've said is Asvadama, Atha, Kunjara makes all the difference. We get it. That's the power of parable, that's the power of story. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just would like to have questions in mind. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, really, we enjoyed your speech, sir, the way you expressed uh, everything. I mean, that's beautiful way. You have made a 175th Friday group really it's a lovable and memorable incident. Uh, so grateful sir we are I request uh, Anjali Sharma will give a vote of uh, thanks. Uh, please. Then we'll go. Yeah, please come to the mic there, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Friday group, I'm glad to be standing here to express my vote of thanks. I extend my heartiest gratitude to Honorable Mr. Justice Retired Senior Advocate Shishadri Naidu for gracing the landmark occasion of the 175th lecture of the Friday group with his presence, wise words, self-deprecating humor, and literary portion. Not every day in the court we get to hear about Samved, Vridangam, and trance. Sir, if well-cultivated human being of Justice Frankfurt involves 
family, law, and literature strictly in that order of Sirway, we concur. Uh, special thanks to Sheshadri Rao sir, our mentor and administrator, who has been organizing these Friday group lectures week after week with unfailing zeal. I would be failing in my duty if I did not thank the beloved members of the Friday group, without the constant participation of whom this group would not have become the academic and intellectual force that it is today becoming. I also warmly extend my thanks to all the attendees here present today. It is participation like yours only to which we at the Friday group continue to feel motivated to keep working and keep delivering. True to the spirit of the Friday group, I cannot but help recall Albert Schweitzer having said, at times our own light goes out and it is rekindled by a spark from another person. Thank you once again. Any questions, please, quickly, sir, please, sir. You raise your hand and uh, please. Any questions, please? Last time I remember having said that when if I don't have questions, I'll fail. <laughs> Anybody wants to know the use of literature in our articulation, please read one book. It's a small book, The Elements of Eloquence. The Elements of Eloquence. The Elements of Eloquence by Mark Forsyth, F-O-R-S-Y-T-H, Mark Forsyth, The Elements of Eloquence. It's an art of rhetoric. What is the meaning of rhetoric? Any idea? Question which doesn't really need an answer. Ah, there lies. What is obvious is apt to be missed. It's something like if somebody asks you what is the meaning, well, how do you define air? Very difficult. So rhetoric, perhaps everybody understands, but difficult to express. Simply put, rhetoric is the art of persuasion. Right? Many people feel using high flown language and uh, making uh, a visual of a spectacle of something. No. Rhetoric means the art of persuasion. And what else advocates do? They do persuade. So our having something to do with rhetoric <laughs> takes us quite a long way. Yes. One question, please. Sir, uh, uh, any lawyer without knowing history, yes. without knowing poetry, without knowing li literature, yes. he cannot be full lawyer at all. How you justify that, sir? Is it mandatory? Yes, sir. Sir, have you heard about distilled water? Distilled water is completely purified without have any, any trace of any sort of mineral residue, whatever. It's also water still. It kills. A lawyer without an exposure to the outside world is distilled water. And a lawyer with all round exposure is a spring water. Yeah. Muttu, you want to ask any question? Please, quickly. You go over there, Mike. I think you spoke about uh, the Vedas and also Mahabharata. Vedas and Mahabharata, I remember once, long back, this is B. S. Shawan, when sitting in, uh, I think, four, four or something, he was advising few lawyers to read the Mahabharata. So, uh, how, what do you suggest or what do you think about uh, reading those things in, in uh, our uh, lawyering life, sir? The Mahabharata and other books. Yeah. May I answer that one? Not only Mahabharata. Read everything worth reading. Somebody may take something from some particular treatise or treatise or some classic, whichever way it's put. And that's why, instead of confining ourselves to one genre of literature, have an all round view. Yes, it's inestimable, it's value, it's moral edific edification, all those things. No denying that. It's one thing to begin with, but let's go on and move on. Need all things possible. Yeah, uh, please, Ahmed, please, quickly. You wait, wait for Mike. Because 175, you don't want to do any unhappiness among the members. Thank you, Pan. It's really a very pleasure for me to have a very good question, uh, question. about the... Okay, I'm a question, question. Sir, the basic thing has gone through so many literature books about Robinson Crusoe, Robinson Crusoe and Robin Hood and all other uh, these things. 
But right now, sir, as we are standing in the pool, and you have correctly said for the purpose of giving the proper inauguration, the one must be a proper uh, conversation with the literature. So right now, the question is about that if we go through the law and to encrypt into the literature, so what is the best way to, to transform literature and law so that it may be easy for everyone to understand what is the correct proposition and what is the correct way for, for the explanation? Yeah. Right, let me tell you. Take your mic. I answered earlier with regard to the J.D. Smith's movie, uh, Karate Kid. See, don't read anything thinking that it's going to ex help you in a particular way. Right? It's a collateral way. Keep reading. What reading? Good piece of po poetry on the wonderful novels. You take the example of, uh, say, Kafka, Trial, then uh, the Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky, all these things. Which way they are useful? Sherlock Holmes, rather, uh, any of those books. You cannot guess and gauge way, uh, which way they are going to. But it's something like muscle memory. Once you internalize them, your brain knows how to, uh, what you call, synthesize them and give a new perspective to that one. So it's not a mathematical formula that I read this book, I gain this one. No, you internalize. It becomes part of you. You become as much learned. And your learning takes a new heights. That's how the literature is useful for us. You stand on the shoulders of those learned men. Nice, nice Thank you. Gita Varma, Gita Varma is here. Gita Varma is here. We are expecting a question from you. Please, please. Wait, wait, wait. Mike what? is coming. Mike what? is coming. Mike is coming. Are you coming? Quickly. Come this side. Gita, be ready with the question. Waiting. Good evening, sir. Law and literature being both complex in nature, my question is... Complex how, in nature. How do one balance between the legal language and the classic literature language? Nicely put. Let me answer you with another book. Right? Please read one book called What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. Thank you. By William Chester. Right? That book says, don't ever declare something as complex. And your mind tends to believe that you are the master of your mind. Right? Always say that it's simple. You know, when you, you are sitting before in the court, your turn will come. Right? And you have to argue. You are, you are nervous. You know, brain doesn't know the difference between fact and fiction. Whatever you feed, it believes to be the truth. So, when you are in attention, Tell yourself, it's not tension, it's excitement. It really becomes excitement. And use your visualization. So imagine, before you could stand up, imagine you have stood up, you are wonderfully delivered, everybody applauds. Your brain doesn't know the difference. It believes that that happened. So it really improves your performance. Right? Don't ever say it's complex. It isn't. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, wait, wait, sir. Mike, Mike, please. Wait for Mike. Gitanjali, you want to ask question? Quickly, quickly. Please, ready with anyone? Please, Anand. You want to ask? Wait, second. Uh, very good evening, sir. Uh, actually, I am speechless after hearing your words and the way you beautifully articulate the the relation between law and literature. I thought of something different. I prepared something different in my mind, but the way you articulate it is completely, um, what to say? I don't have words. Thank you. Yeah. But uh, what I was thinking right now, what if you just now said you need to go through many of the books, you mentioned many of the books and uh, uh, about mathematical uh, books also you mentioned. But what if, if some person is not aware of uh, this kind of books or he or the person is not want to go with all those books and he has to present his case currently on the spot, what would you suggest to him? You want to be tall like Amitha or you want to be short like any dwarf? It's your choice. <laughs> 
when you don't have exposure. My question is very serious. No, no. I'm just telling. I, again, that's judgmental, right? See, what I say is, the happiest way to look at life is never ever judge anything, right? It should be an open thing, right? Now I tell you. Earlier, we were struggling to get a source. Suppose I wanted to read Shakespeare, it's next to impossible. Because I had to buy a book and there are no paraphrasing. It's difficult to understand. We pretend to understand, but difficult to understand. Now, you spend 250 rupees, you will get, don't fear Shakespeare series. Or if you want to plagiarize, in the sense if you want to steal, go to YouTube, rather Google, click, you will get all those things with easy explanations, etc. And you don't know how many books are there or what are really useful books. You simply Google, saying that, what are the best non-fiction books for a lawyer? What are the best fiction books for a lawyer? Somebody presents all the list. What are the best hundred books in the world? Again, you will get them. So sky is the limit. So you have got the resources. All that you want is time. Then what's meant by time? I, last time I told you about the power of incremental learning. We feel something humongous, impossible to achieve. Something like counting the stars on a clear night. I just asked some of you that if the night is very clear and there is no daybreak, it continues. If you are asked to count each star, how much, how much time it takes, how many years, centuries, or is it impossible? What could be the answer? Impossible. Impossible. Right? A mathematician has developed a formula. He said it takes four and a half years. What I say is, what sounded, uh, even I felt the same way, what sounded to us as impossible when broken into its minute parts becomes achievable. So that way, you don't need to read that one stretch of all the literature on earth. Read 15 minutes a day. What I do? I get into my car, even now. I, uh, by the time I reach Supreme Court, it's 15 minutes. I make it a point to keep one book there on literature. I read aloud as if I were a news reader by the time, by the time I come to this uh, court. This is how that incremental learning happens. That's why I said, right? It's a serious question. I believe it's a serious answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, good evening. So, my name is Shivaji Sharma, and I believe I'm kind of so ignorant in all of these, related, related to all these facts that you have mentioned. You are not ignorant, you are blissful. <laughs> Thank you. There is sometimes a contradiction arise when we used to read uh, when we read uh, like the reality and morality. Mm. So when we read any literature, so there is sometimes we believe that uh, a literature is more tilted towards morality. So as we you stated about the Mahabharata yes. or Vedas, yes. so it is more or less uh, tilted towards morality. So how so how can we deal with this issue? When the contradiction arises between reality and morality. See, very wonderful question. But I'll answer tongue in cheek. Then I'll go seriously. Both the ways I've said. If you know a lot about morality, you will also come to know how to be moral. <laughs> right? First <laughs> thing is that. And true. Please remember, law is amoral. Law has no morality. Right. That's why we are swayed sometimes by this moral notion. As a lawyer, we can't have moral standards. Ethical standards will have. There's a subtle distinction between these two. You need to be ethical. But you can't refuse a case saying that the client is immoral because he has not paid the money back having admitted and he has not paid all those things. You are right. When it comes to literature, it may be edifying, moralizing, but at the end, once you know the nuances, you know how to articulate all those things. That's why, if you know one phase of it, if you know about the whole about atheism, you can't be a good atheist. You should also know about God. And if you want to be a good spiritual person, knowing about God alone doesn't, isn't enough. You have to know about atheism as well. This is a full combination that makes you a full man. Right? Thank you. I think now we will wind up. Thank you very much, friends. Let's join for a cup of tea.
and I can't take your autograph.